man called Noah. Noah has been very busy since we left him two weeks ago. Probably a century of time has passed, and you're thinking, that really was a long sermon last week. Noah and his family, well, in that time, they've been fruitful. They've constructed an ark. They corralled the animals. Now, God brought the animals to them, but but they had to get them kind of corralled and ready to go. And, well, they had to feed the animals, so they've done gathering the food. And, well, during all of that work, um, they made sure to invite everybody and anybody that wanted to come on the voyage to come on board. But we're to that point. The clock has run out. Time's up. The storm, it's about to start, and it's time to go. Seven days from now, I will send rain to them on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And I'm sure as Noah gets that message, he's got some mixed feelings when God says, the Lord said to Noah, go on the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. And at those words, I'm sure Noah's kind of happy. After all, I got the ark done in time. I got a place to go. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. The days of people ridiculing me for what I'm doing, they're done. And well, you know, I'm going to get to go on this little trip, and I get to take my whole family, my three sons, their wives, and my wife, and well, we're all going to go into this together. But on another part, I got a sneaky suspicion Noah was probably a little bit scared. After all, God, this is the first boat I ever built. You think maybe we should do a stress test first? I mean, what if it springs a leak? Huh? Um, Lord, you're about to seal me into this ark with all of these wild animals, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. You think that's really a good plan? But you know what I think Noah's biggest fear was? What we call the unknown. God, what's this world going to look like after the flood? What's it going to be like after the flood? I'm sure he's got so many questions. So while he's happy and scared, you, you know there's another part of him, right? As much grief as Noah has taken over the years, I'm sure he just couldn't shake, shake the feeling. And it made him sad. When he gets off of the ark, all of these people... They're going to be dead. That includes my enemies, my friends, my neighbors, and any of my family that didn't get on this ark. Because this ark, it's their only choice. And they just won't get on, God. And with all of these feelings, we need to remember Noah held tight to his faith in God. Genesis chapter 7, verses 13 through 16. On that very day, so no delay, no negotiation with God. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of the three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, Pairs of all creatures that have, been, that have the breath of life in them came to Noah, and Noah entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing. As God had commanded Noah, then the Lord shut him in. You know how much faith that must have taken? And I began thinking about Noah and his faith 
that he had to have to do all the things that he's done for an entire lifetime. And then I began to ask myself a question. How is placing my faith in Jesus like Noah entering the ark? And if you ever want to see what a simple five-point outline looks like, this is it. Because this is about as simple as you get as far as an outline goes. How does my faith in Jesus mimic the faith of Noah? And the first thing I find out is the ark was God's plan, not man's idea. Noah didn't wake up one morning and say, you know what? Just in case it rains, I think I'll build a boat. That, that wasn't his logic. Nor did Noah call out to God and say, hey, God, I'm, I'm sure you haven't noticed, but this world, she's getting mighty bad, and all of these things are going wrong, and these people don't get it. Tell you what, God, how about I build a boat, I'll get on the boat, and you wipe them out. That, that, that wasn't how this worked. Nope. God gave Noah very specific instructions, and Noah followed them. That's how the plan works. And what, when I jump forward and I start thinking about the Jesus plan, you know what? There isn't much difference from it. From the dawn of sin, Jesus has been the answer. I will put an enmity between the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your, crush your head and you will strike his heel. Jesus is not a man-made story. This is not a Grimm's fairy tale. This is not something that somebody came up with because they needed to sell a book. This was God's plan. He is 100% the redemption plan. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for he, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in the sight, in, in sight, in love. And, well, here's the thing. The plan that he laid out, it was, it was kind of simple, according to John 3.16. Everything you need to know, you can find right here in this one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his, only one, his one and only Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, plan is simple. Noah had the expectation that he would do it God's way, and guess what? He did. God gave us Jesus, the plan, and you know what? There is no other. Which brings us to the second thing that we see when we look at how our, our faith has to mimic Jonah. I mean, Jonah. I'm having one of those mornings. Mimic Noah's. Guess what? There was only one way in. This is how God said Noah was supposed to build that ark. Genesis chapter 6, verse 16. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and opening one cubic high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make, it, and make lower, middle, and upper decks. So, folks, it was a mighty big door. But how many doors? One door. At first blush, I want to tell you something. I've been on ships and boats, and this seems like a really bad plan. I mean, if there's only one door, what happens if something goes wrong and I need to get out? Where was he going? Seriously, he did not need an escape hatch from the ark because guess what? It was his only chance. Noah was going to enter that ark and exit that ark only once. It wasn't like God's going to say, we're going to use it this time. Hang on to it, Noah, because we're going to do this again in about five years. Uh-uh. One in one out, one door. And guess what? That's Jesus. It's the same for me when I come to faith in Christ. Therefore, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Now, if you're not a farmer or you haven't been around a sheep before, you understand what a gate is, though, right? It's the way that you get into the sheep pen, and it's the way that you get out of the sheep pen. And Jesus identifies himself as the gate, not a gate, okay, the gate, the only entrance for the sheep. He follows it up in John chapter 14, verse 6, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way, not a way. If I try to go into, the, into this any other way except for through Jesus, then you know what? It isn't going to work. 
You see, in my response to the Jesus sacrifice, I, I, I can't make my own escape hatch, escape hatch. I can't say, you know, God, the Jesus thing was real cool, but, you know, I have a much better plan on how to get me into a relationship with you. You can't build that escape hatch. You, you can't build your own game plank. There was one little plank, one little entrance that went up, and there everything went up there, and you couldn't say, well, you know what, I don't like that one, so, so I think I'll build myself a side entrance over here, and I, I'm, I'm going to build my own. That's not the way it works with Jesus. There's only one way in. You don't... Um, Get to crawl through the window. Now, was there a window? Yeah, one cubic by one cubic, a little square, but that was for Noah to look out, <clears throat> not for something to get in. Hmm, so I can't get that way. You know what? By all means, please don't get the bright idea that you're going to cut a hole in the ark. You don't get to cut your own little entrance and, like, drill a hole and say, I can crawl in this way. I'll just kind of get there. Just so you know... I have heard people say this. You do not get into this relationship by the skin of your teeth. You don't. There's only one way in, and it's really plain and simple. Either you are coming to Christ, and you're coming as an adopted child of God, or you're not coming at all. You don't get to come up with an alternate version or an alternate theory of your plan. It's Jesus or nothing. You're either all in or you're all out. There's no in the middle. Now, while that seems like a very narrow vision and a very narrow idea, you, you, you do need to remember, for Noah, this was an open invitation. I keep stressing this because it's very important. Noah, his wife, his sons, his daughters in law were the only humans on the ark. But the door was open for anybody that wanted to come in. That's important. God did not make salvation through that ark some religious ritual. Just simply, folks, make this real easy. Get on the ark! You didn't come up and yeah, as you were going up the game plan, you got to know and know. It's like, do you have the password? There was no password. There was no secret handshake that you had to do. There was nothing that you had to do except for come up the gangplank and get on the ark. As I was researching this, and I got this really funny thought in my head, when God told Noah that things come onto the ark, God didn't even say, he said where and when, but he didn't even say how to get on the ark. No, you could hop, you could skip, you could run, you could walk, you could crawl, whatever modes or means of transportation you had to get up that plank, God said, that's fine. As long as you realize, up the plank you must go and into the ark you must go. God did not limit the entrance, the invitation to the entrance of the ark to skin color, gender, birthright, or here's the one that maybe surprises you. Even sin you were participating in before you got on the ark. So everybody? Everybody. Anybody? Anybody. Doesn't matter what I did, I could still get on the ark? Yep. I got to buy a ticket. Nope, no ticket. Just come on in. Come up the plank. Because you know what? That's what it was all about. When we jump to the Jesus plan, don't you find it ironic that when God called out the animals, there were, un there were unclean animals and clean animals on the ark, but only one kind of human. See, that's how salvation works. Through Jesus, it says the world and whoever. There is no distinction. It isn't, well, the Americans, but not this country. There isn't a, this kind of person, but not that kind of person. Well, person that are doing this, but aren't. That's not the way it works. The invitation is for whoever wants to get on the ark. Paul states it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-4. through 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. It was an open invitation, but you do get an invitation, right? What good is the invitation 
if you don't have the appropriate response. You know, whoever, who or where you are, God doesn't really care. It's unimportant. But at the end, you have to be included under the cross. You have to be willing to come to Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past, but you know what? It does matter what you do with Jesus going forward. When you come face to face with that moment, you can't say, hold on, God, give me a few more days. You can't say, hey, God, I'll think about it and I'll get back with you. No. Face to face with Jesus, you've gotten your invitation, the ark has been built, and now he just wants to know, are you going to respond to the invitation? Now, it's one thing to see it all out there. It's one thing to hear all about it. It's one thing to accept the invitation, but, but you do understand. For the people to be saved in Noah's day, they had to get on board and, we don't think about this often, stay on board. Noah and his family, they built the ark, but building the ark wasn't enough, wasn't it? He couldn't say, look God, there's your boat, woohoo, we're good, right? I'm all done, I built your boat. The people in the world, they saw the ark, but seeing the ark, that's not enough either, right? God, I know about the ark. I even took the guided tour. Noah gave us a tour before they shut the door, and I took it, and I can tell you where all the things in the ark are, so we're all good. I've seen the ark. Nope. Noah's sons grew up hearing all about the ark, but you know what? Hearing about the ark, that wasn't what's going to make you saved, is it? What's the only way that you want to be saved by that ark. You had to make a decision. You had to make a personal decision. I find it very interesting that God read the roster out. Noah, wife, Ham, Shem, Japheth, wives, everybody. This is who's getting on the ark. They had to make their decision. And each one had to make their own personal choice. Noah didn't take his kids and say, you're getting on this ark whether you like it or not. Up you go. Ham, Shem, and Japheth didn't look at their wives and say, you will go. No. Noah didn't even get to look at his own wife and say, get on board. What are you thinking? Of course you're going. Every individual had to make their individual choice up the ark, up that plank and into the ark, or not. Guess what? That's how it works when it comes to the Jesus plan. The second ark the salvation has been offered to us through Jesus, just so you get it. Knowing about Jesus is not good enough. I don't care how many trivia questions you can answer. You can have the best trivial pursuit knowledge that's ever out there about Jesus. If you don't know him, it's useless to you. If you haven't placed your life in him, it's useless to him. Hearing about him? I have heard lots of sermons in my day. I'm sure you have too. If you grew up with parents that are from a Christian background, they probably have lectured you until you're tired of hearing about the Jesus thing. You're probably like, I got this. I can answer all the questions. Hearing about it's not enough, folks. Learning more about Jesus, that's not good enough. Just gathering more information into your brain, that is not what salvation is about. You see... Your response, plain and simple, you must get on board. And again, I'd like to reiterate, you need to stay on board. You must know him, and he must know you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 33 says, And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. I don't know who you are. That's what Jesus is saying. We've never met. You know all about me? Well, that's really good. I don't have a clue who you are. You never took the time to introduce yourself. You really don't have an active, connected relationship with me. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So I got a really good, simple analogy for you on this one. And it's not as long as last week's, I promise. This is a really short analogy. I want you to think for a second. 
What if back in Noah's day, Noah said, God said in seven days, the earth earth is going to be destroyed. Last call, all aboard. And there was one person that said, you know what? I'm going up the plank. And they get up to to the top of the plank and they're, find a spot on the boat away from all the animals because they don't really want to sit with the animal in the animal section. So they get in there and they sit down on the ark and day one passes and they're still sitting there. And day two passes and, and, and they're still sitting there. And day three passes and they're still sitting there. Day four comes and they're getting a little squirmy. It's a little claustrophobic even though it's a big ark. Day five comes and they're getting a little bit more. And on day six, they decide, you know what? I'm going out. I, I'm not staying. And they come back down the plank. And they don't come back up. They were on the ark. But what's going to happen to them? You drown. Do you get that? You don't get to enter and exit and enter and exit and enter and exit and enter and exit and enter and exit. That's not the way. You enter and you stay put in the relationship with God. How do we miss this? Until the art door was shut, could they have left? Anytime they wanted to. But they had to choose to stay. Or they drown. It's really, really that simple. So Noah's faith, God planned it, God promised it, And I want you to pay really close attention. It was God that sealed it. I'm sorry, Tennessee Annie Ford. Noah didn't shut the door. God shut the door. God decided how long before the rain started. Noah, you got seven days. Can I have eight, God? Noah, you've got seven days. Make your plans. Make your prep. Last minute things. Make sure you cut the water off because there's more cold water coming. Okay? You've got seven days. Get on the ark. God decided when to shut the door. Can you imagine what it must have felt like to Noah as he's sitting there and all of a sudden God said, and he heard that moment when the locking mechanism clicks and it's ka-plump. And then it's all silent. Because God chose, it's time to shut the door. Anybody that's in, you're good. Anybody that's not, you drown. As you begin to think about it, it was God decided when to um, start, when to stop the rain. God started it, and it wasn't like Noah got into day 35. He's like, okay, God, enough is enough, all right? You said 40 days, but really, 35 days of this, isn't that enough? This would have been a great sermon for COVID time, right? Isn't it enough that you shut me in here this long? God, it's enough, right? God said, no, I said 40, and we're going to follow my plan, not your plan. God decided how long before Noah could exit. So after the water was all gone and Noah gets the bird brain idea to start sending out birds, say, are we there yet, God? By the way, Noah created the game. The one that we play every vacation, are we there yet? Noah created the game. God, are we there yet? Here's a bird. Oh, that one came back. Are we there yet? Here's another bird. That one came back. God, you understand. Are we there yet? God said, we're there when I open the door and tell you you can exit. This is my plan, Noah, not yours. And you need to stick with it. And when Noah stuck with it, he was signed and sealed for deliverance. Think about that. At the moment that door shut, at the moment that door clicked shut, and Noah and his family and all those animals were there, they were signed They were sealed, and the next thing they were going to experience was deliverance because the rain, she wasn't coming. And it's about time that we understand this is how it works, even in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Wait a minute, so I've been signed, sealed, and delivered? No, you've been signed and sealed for future deliverance. You understand, you have not been delivered yet. You've just been postmarked 
for deliverance. You're still waiting for deliverance. But in that deliverance, God has made a promise. And Paul says that promise, it's a deposit. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. No one who is fashioned, now the one who is fashioned for us, this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. I like the idea. Deposit is a guarantee of promises not yet fulfilled by the promiser. Now, we're very familiar with the idea of a deposit, right? So, if I come to you and you got something for sale, and I say, I'm going to buy it, but I, I'm not going to give you all the money now, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a $50 deposit, and, you, and I'm promising you I'm going to come back and take what I say I'm going to take. If I decide not to come back and take what I said I was going to take, what happens to my deposit? I lose it. Ponder that. So God has sent his Holy Spirit to seal you as the deposit, the guarantee of what he promised you. If God doesn't fulfill the plan, you understand what he's saying. I lose my deposit. Now, think about it the other way. If I came to you and you had your thing for sale and I gave you $50 to hold it, and then I went away and I came back in a little while and I said, okay, I'm here to get the rest of it, and you say, you know what, I've decided I'm not going to sell it. What happens to the deposit? You have to have it given back to you. Same thing works here. If, I, if God comes to me and he seals me and I say, you know what, God, I'm not really interested in this whole Jesus thing anymore. I have never seen it done. But I give you back that which you gave me. I'm done. You do get it, right? You walked off of the ark before the door got shut. You didn't lose your salvation. You, you returned it. And I've never actually met the person I think has done that, but that is one of those things the Bible talks about. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. It is God's promise. I promise you, I'm coming back someday. I am going to deliver you. I am going to take you to heaven. I promise. If he fails to break that, if he fails to fulfill that promise, he loses his deposit. But if I fail to come, if I fail to deliver on what I say I was going to do, I have to return the deposit. That's how scripture actually paints it out. Because in the end, you are signed and sealed for deliverance. What you heard from me, keep what you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Folks, this was not a vacation for Noah. He wasn't just kind of sitting around. There were responsibilities before, during, and after the ark experience. And like Noah, we will spend the rest of our days living the plan, claiming the promise. And holding tight to the seal. Provided you were actually signed and sealed for deliverance. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 through 22. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who, is, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him, it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. I call God as my witness, and I stake my life on it, that it was, it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for the joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So here is my question today. Are you signed, sealed, and ready for deliverance? Are you on board? 
Great. If you're not, come see me after church. I'll show you how you get on board with Jesus. More importantly, now that you're on board, have you committed your life to stay in the relationship? Stay on board the ark. In this case, stay with the relationship that is Jesus.